And we're going to start off this morning with, actually, I, sh I should have found out what, uh, what you are. Are you a, a keynote speaker, a tutorial speaker? You're a keynote speaker. He's a, we have a speaker, and it's Ram uh, Ramon Laflamme from IQC in Waterloo. And I don't actually know what his title is, because it doesn't say here, but he'll tell us. Thank you, John, for the wonderful introduction. <laughs> wonderful and stimulating. And now that you're facing me, you can look at what is the title of uh, my talk. <laughs> and maybe I should start the same way as Danielle started. The title of my, or in this analog way, the title of my talk is I the same one as the one I had four years ago. Not in the title. But there are neat things that have happened in experimental quantum error correction, and this is what I'm going to talk about for the next hour. In fact, I will not talk very much about what happens before 2007, and I'll try to kind of fill up the gaps of some of the interesting things. It'll be a biased view. Uh, it will be some, many of the things will be related to the work we've done uh, at Waterloo, but I will add some pieces which I picked up from other people around the world. And when I was preparing my talk, I didn't know that some of those people would be here, like Reiner or Matthew Reed. So I will skip on them, but I'll kind of make some comments about my views of some of their work, some of them, bo both the kind of neat things and the work which uh, left to be done. So if I look at the interesting things that have happened uh, in, quantum in quantum error correction in the last uh, two or four years, um, I'm thinking about benchmarking and certifying gates or understanding the no noise that we have on our quantum system, trying to figure it out in an experimental way, make a relation with fault tolerance quantum computing um, is one piece where a lot of progress has been done. And I'll take about half of the time of my talk to mention these results. And then after that, uh, I'll talk about some of the implementation of quantum error correction in different ways and the places where I thought neat results have been done. And I will conclude. And I should say the conclusion will be, in case you kind of get distracted between here and the end, the conclusion is there has, there has been a lot of very neat results. We are starting really with uh, to have small quantum processors where the ideas of quantum error correction can really be implemented. And we've seen this in not only one technology, but many of them. Uh, I would say the, the other side of uh, this, which can be seen as a plus or a minus, is there's a lot of uh, way to go before we get really fault tolerant devices. So that can bring some questions for the theoretician of are we really going the right way? Or for the experimentalists, many, many things to do in the day to day. Um, I'd prepare a slide to talk about the accuracy threshold theorem, which is really underlying this presentation on quantum error correction. Um, but Andrew's talk was so great that I think I'm going to skip it. But in fact, I had written I was going to skip it until Robert Resendorf made a comment yesterday that you can find up there. He says, accuracy threshold, theorem proof, what is left? And then he says, oh, there's two things left. What is the value of the threshold? And what is the operational cost of doing this? And then just move on. Um, so maybe this is a theoretical point of view. I would add one more is that are we really going in the right path with all these circuits? That was something. And John Preskill's talk yesterday goes a little bit in that direction of maybe we should think about topological uh, systems. Can we do, make them more robust? Or are there ways that we can find to make qu quantum uh, processors more robust in order to reach these thresholds that uh, Robert are going to give to us in a short time. Um, the second question I would add also is that uh, can we implement this experimentally, all these, all these, um, uh, these protocols and ways of doing this? And I'll come back to, the, to this in a few minutes with another comment that I've heard yesterday that kind of should be taken again with some, where we see a gap between the theory and the experiment. 
But for me, part of this is really to understand, can we really do fault around quantum computing? And can, where can we go with the device that we have today? What are the assumptions between this theorem? Of course, a theorem is a theorem, so it must be right, but there's a bunch of assumptions in there. Are these assumptions realistic or not? And then I'll come back to Andrew's talk, and he put some of these maybe in slightly different orders. Um, these uh, ingredient for fault around quantum error correction, uh, parallel operation. So indeed, there are devices that we have around today which do not have parallel operation. So should we re uh, rule them out? And my view is yes, if you really want to have a large quantum computer. But if you want to have a small processor where suddenly you want to use it as a sensor, maybe there are things that you can use of quantum error correction without having parallel operation and improve the, these devices. So for large scale quantum computing, you need parallel operation. We also need quantum control, and I will talk quite a lot about this. How much control do we have? How do we improve? Um, trying to see how much improvement we've seen in the last five or 10 years. I'll give some exam concrete example in an MR of how much improvement we've seen, so I'll mention this. Uh, ability to extract en entropy, uh, something that needs to be done. David Corey mentioned about th this yesterday uh, in my talk four years ago, I mentioned about algorithmic cooling, so I decided that I was not going to mention it again today. Um, but we'll see a little bit of this related to the ion trap quantum error correction, place where they are able to extract the entropy, make measurements, and kind of go many rounds of error correction. Um, and the last part is the knowledge about the noise. How do we know what is the noise of our device? So my friends, the theorists, comes in and they say, oh, we have a depolarizing model. The error is independent from qubit to qubit. We'll go and make this construction. We pull this theorem. And is that real or not? And this is what has motivated me to, in fact, doing an MR. That I was wondering, here's a specific device. Can we kind of go and check some of these uh, assumptions? And I'll come back to this in the next hour. Um, there's an underlying assumption that comes in also, and lots of qubit. And my friend, the computer scientist, says, you don't have to worry about this because it's only a polynomial amount. So, um, so I do not worry about this. So I go back and look at this graph here, which is a num number of qubits as a number of qubit as a function of time, adapted from Michael Mendenberg uh, slide somewhere, where I've added a little data. And uh, in one of the uh, talk yesterday, we heard that overhead, something like three is better than 10 to the 11. And I look at this, and I said, I was the, at, at the time, that slide in front of me, I said, I wish this would be the log of number of qubit as a function of time as this is about kind of 10 or 11, 13 here, and this is three here. So if it would be the log, then it would be in good shape. In practice, we're not. So um, people have claimed to have manipulated up to about uh, a little bit more than a dozen of quantum bits. Uh, if you look at the pieces in red are the ones where we have uh, the device has prepared a specific state. Uh, the other colors are one where the claim is that they can do universal quantum computation. So very few number of quantum bits. So as soon as you think of more than three or four or five, then very little control. In fact, the action and what we have seen in the last couple of years on quantum error correction is more down here. So there's devices in trap, uh, superconducting qubits, and MR was kind of being able to manipulate a few qubits with the ability of showing um, a first demonstration that we can we have enough control to indicate that one day we might be able to do quantum error correction. So I think this is humble enough as a step, and it opens the way in the future to do much better. The second part I want to uh, mention, which is related to what's happening here, is increasing amount of control. So I remember maybe 10, 15 years ago having people telling me that it might be impossible to control quantum system with accuracy more than a few percent. Uh, or there was even some brasher comments that it was impossible to control quantum system. So we know today that it is not true. We cannot control them as well as we can. But we have ideas of how to make these, uh, this control. 
uh, and how to improve it. And we arrive to values of error per gates, which starts to be reasonable from 10 minus 2, 10 minus 3, 10 minus 4, and even more recently some uh, tolerance of 10 minus 5, and I will come back in this. So I want to uh, Uh, mention how do we benchmark gates, and this is work which uh, Manny Knill has uh, uh, put forward. And the basic idea is to benchmark certain gates and to have an idea of how much control we have and use this value of what is the control on these quantum gates and try to relate it to values of accuracy threshold. We usually think of um, we usually think of quantum computers as system which prepares certain states, let's say the state zero, measure in certain basis, and then make a set of universal gates. And then usually in your first intradium computing, we think about any generic two-qubit gate, or a given two-qubit gate and a generic one, uh, one qubit gate. It turns out that for fault tolerance reason, and we've heard this from Andrew uh, Landall yesterday, then it's quite hard to do this. It takes a lot of overhead. So there have been ideas of using simpler sets of gates. For example, only the Clifford gates, gates like the Y rotation and an X rotation around uh, of pi over two in the Brock sphere, measuring in the uh, computational basis and preparing the state zero. And using these gates, because they have nice uh, fault tolerance uh, implementations. Unfortunately, this is not universal, but it can become universal between, with one addition, one extra states, generally called a, a magic state, either the pi over eight states, cos pi over eight zero, plus uh, sine pi over eight one, or what is called a magic state, state, which is on the Brock sphere, equidistance of the axis x, y, or z. So uh, the focus on benchmarking gates will be mostly on this, and then I will come back at the end and talk about um, the magic state, and in particular distillation if we have imperfect magic, magic states. So the idea of MADI was, can we give one number of how good we are at doing one qubit gates? And his idea was, well, if we can in some way turn the noise into some depolarizing noise, there would be one number that comes in, the parameter in the, the depolarizing noise. And if we do this by making a sequence of one or a certain set of gates, another larger number set of gates, and a larger number, then we can uh, do this, find a line in there which gives this parameter, and this would be independent of the errors that occurs in the measurement, the errors that occurs in the state preparation. Um, the idea was to use Clifford gates, and we know that if we use Clifford gates, when we combine them, we end up with a Clifford gates that's easy to invert. So what we should end up at the end should be the state that we've prepared, independent in some way of the state preparation. And um, then we can go and measure some slopes of this and gives us an idea of how well do we do. So the idea again, as I mentioned, is to prepare many instantiation of, let's say, having seven gates in there, make many instantiation of them. So you'll see these little dots there. Same thing for another random number, let's say 13, and then kind of 37s, and then increasing this number, draw this line, and you can show that the model of uh, the noise when you have these random gates that comes in looks like a depolarizing model. That makes sense as long as the noise is independent from gate to the gate, and the gate, the, the noise is not time dependent. So if you do this, you find this number, and here's a list of uh, different uh, qubit uh, gate errors that have been published from different groups, and you can get the values of them, which is between 10 minus 3, 10 minus 5. Definitely a progress. If I go back four or five years ago, we would get, or let's say 10 years ago, we'd get 10 minus 1 to 10 minus 2. So progress of 1 to 2 order of magnitude in there. And we'll see improvement in this as people kind of try to challenge the devices that they have to get better, better um, error rates. Uh, a few comments in there. Um, I look at the single ion trap so a result which was published very recently, 10 minus 5. This should be compared to a result that they had three or four years ago where uh, they get about 10 to minus 3. And the interest uh, for me in there was to see what they have done to make it two orders of magnitude in the space of two or three years. And it is really 
care system uh, designs and careful pulse generation that they had. So they have a series of places where they could make small increment here and there where suddenly kind of the error rate kind of can go down by, by some reasonable amount. In fact, one thing I found interesting is that this uh, experiment here was done on an iron trap where they use, it's in the group of Wineland, they use uh, microwave radiation to make the one qubit gate and they build a small antenna next to the iron trap so that they can read what is the field that comes out of their microwave and be sure that it is the intended field that they had. And this is something that we had done also in uh, NMR uh, some, some years ago, uh, is we um, make gates by kind of pulsing with certain shapes to kind of mitigate the effects of some inhomogeneity, some of the fact that the amplifiers are imperfect, that they don't make square shapes that we want to do. So we make these simulation, we vary the shapes so that it does indeed the gate that we want, but when we send it through the amplifier, then there are distortions. And these distortion will lead to errors, but with these little antennas that we put in there, we can read what the field looks like. We can make a, a feedback loop, correct it, and then we get the pulses that we want. So this gives an idea of error rate for one qubit gates, which are going towards what people believe the threshold would be if we would have a scalable device. So this is a great improvement, show kind of really uh, progress in the ways to scalable quantum computation. Um, but this should be careful when I mention this is not too far from the threshold because these are for only one qubit system. And what people are, have been doing, and then you can see this in, uh, in the ion trap, it was a trap for a single ion they had in their gates. If they have a single ions in there, there might be error which are induced on the second gates which are not taken into account. In the MR, we took one molecule, which was the best molecule we could think of, and then we kind of optimized everything for that particular qubit. So if we try to think about this for larger systems, then we have to start to think about what's going to happen, the impact. And the, uh, up to very recently, the idea of generalizing many's ideas to many qubits kind of hit some problems because we didn't know how this noise will kind of go down to um, to uh, a depolarized model and having a single um, parameter to characterize the noise. Um, here's some data uh, that we've taken at, at uh, Waterloo on uh, ESR. So we've built a re recent ESR to be able to do some uh, quantum computation. And we implemented this benchmark to look at how the ESR that we built uh, was working together. Here's an example of using the best um, qubit that we have. It's um, uh, a nitrogen, the electron and the nitrogen uh, inside, uh, uh, inside the, a carbon 60 ball. So it's very well isolated from the rest. We have a sample of those and then we can go and manipulate the system, go and look at this benchmarking. So you can see the number of uh, gates we do up to about 200 gates, many instantiation, about 20 to 30 instantiation of each of these. Uh, we can draft this line, and then what we get, we can fit the, this line, get the parameter B, which is related to the error uh, pair gates, and the error pair gates in that case is about 10 to the minus four. So show that we can have control there, but if we go to two qubits and try to do the same things, then we'd have rather difference. In fact, maybe it's a gauge not only of how good the qubit is, but how good the apparatus that we have around to control the qubit. So part of both of them. Um, should mention that uh, the value of error pair gate is not the value of what we would get if the error would come only from T2. And this was the same as what we had in the NMR. So which tells us that there is something in the apparatus which control these qubits that we don't fully understand, or maybe the Hamiltonian that we have is not exactly the right Hamiltonian. But putting this all together tells you that we still have a reasonable amount of control on the system. And that led to a bunch of uh, things that we have to be very careful at. If the error rate starts to be 10 minus 3, 10 minus 4, then just the calibration of what we mean by a pi over 2 gate starts to be very important. So we have to have better and better idea of how do we calibrate the initial state or the gates that we want to do. So very uh, bunch of things that we learn by doing this. 
Here's a marking of gate, and this is not done with this random uh, randomization of the different gates, except for an attempt in liquid state and MR. But this is something I've looked in the, uh, the literature where people have either implemented some algorithms or um, claimed that the certain error per gate, per two qubit gate they had. Uh, it's a little bit dated, 2009, 2008, but it gives you an idea of where it is and how different it is from the one qubit gate. So the error rate per two qubit gate is about one person for most of the device that we have compared to the 10 minus three, 10 minus four that we had in the previous gate. Um, my bet is that people can do a little bit better than this, 0.5%, but as soon as you arrive to two qubit gates, you can see things become harder. Uh, system, all, already to go from one to two is hard, one to three. And work has been done, and Joseph Emerson at Warhol has been working to make a benchmark for more than two qubits. So, that must have been an important comment I made. <laughs> um, to generalize the, the, the Manny's procedure to, to go to two qubit. So the next thing that I want to do is how do we, um, when we think about benchmarking two qubit or one, two or three qubit gates or Clifford gates in general, we would get one number, what is the error pair gate? Maybe we should think about benchmarking or certify certain type of gates and which is the one that we are gonna use in our quantum computation. And how would we do this? So suppose that we have a gate which corresponds to a certain, a certain Clifford, the decoding of the five bit codes. How do we know how good we are at doing this? Or if we have a 10 bit code or a 20 bit code, how do we, are we sure that it is really doing what we expect it to do? So one way of doing this comes into a place uh, to, to some work I've done with uh, Joseph Emerson some years ago on characterized noise in quantum systems. And we'll see how we can adapt this to certify certain type of gates in particular uh, the, the Clifford ones. In order to think about this, I have to kind of go back and think about uh, how do we characterize noise. We know how to do this exactly, which is by using tomography. So we can evolve the uh, density matrix and we can describe this evolution through cross operators and the basic idea is how do we go and find these cross operators. One way of doing this, which is slightly different, is using what is called the chi matrix. Um, it makes sense uh, when we think about error correction as we can, the chi matrix is essentially the expansion of these A's in terms of tensor product of poly operators, which I called P's up here. If we want to do the chi matrix um, exactly, and we find that we can do this by tomography, and we, can, we quickly realize that it is very hard to do it for more than a few qubits. In fact, for a single qubit, we need a dozen of parameters for n qubits, we need four to the two n, and four to the two n goes very fast, especially when you're in the lab. Um, here's an experiment, a result of, oh, there's something missing here. So I had an example of a three qubit system where the process tomography had done exactly by David Corey around 2004, 2005, so you have this matrix of uh, a few thousand elements in there, it looks like a skyscraper of New York City of all these old block in there. And essentially when you look at this, you can see, yes, the theory looks pretty much like the experiment, but very hard to make any quantify, qu quantitative uh, comments on this. So how could we get some quantitative numbers which would help us to characterize noise? At the end, if we want to do error correction, we're not interested to know about all the correlation between the noise, but we're interested in only a few parameters. What kind of parameters would we be interested in? Well, we wouldn't be interested in knowing which qubit is kind of has errors on it. We wouldn't be that interested to know exactly what is the details of the error. So if I would be able to give you, what is the probability of zero error? What is the probability of one error, independent of which qubit it is, independent if it is a X, Y, or Z error? What is the probability of two errors? Uh, of course, if we've done the process tomography, we can find this. We just kind of cross grain all these numbers, and then we can get this. But the question is, can we do this efficiently without having to go through process tomography? And it turns out the answer is yes. And the basic idea is, instead of coarse graining the data that you've observed, maybe you can coarse grain the, 
the, the noise that you're doing. So working on the noise, manipulate so that what comes out, what pops out of the experiments uh, are these numbers. So if you, you think about coarse graining is really to apply symmetry. The question is, what is the symmetry which corresponds to uh, a bunch of qubits where you want to know these numbers? So the first one is just permutation of your qubits. So you just, as you do your protocol to find these numbers, you're going to permit your qubits all the time so that it doesn't depend on which qubit exactly the errors occurred. The second one, to find a uh, probability of, <coughs> let's say, zero error, the idea is to average over the um, SU2 group for each of the qubits. So if you do this, then you can find these numbers that comes one by one, except that doing an integral in the lab with my qubits is a little bit hard. Fortunately, people have realized that doing this integral over this SU2 group for each of the qubit is equivalent to a sum for uh, the Clifford group. And this, call, this thing, for my friends, the computer scientists, are called two designs. And this makes it more amenable to apply it in the lab with the idea of applying a, a discrete set of gates that we can implement in our system. In fact, in particular, if you look at this and you think about the Clifford group as being implemented by the simplistic group in the poly group, then the idea is just to apply these gates and these gates and make a sum over all of them. If you look at this uh, poly group and you make this sum over here, you realize that the poly group, its impact will be to kill the off diagonal terms of the sky matrix. And if you implement the symplectic group, the effect of it is that it will randomize the error x, y, and z so that you cannot distinguish between each of them. So the number of x errors will be the same as y errors because this group is gonna just kind of ship them with each other. So by implementing the permutation group in the group, what happens is that this chi matrix becomes diagonal and there's only uh, n plus one uh, numbers that are left with this, which correspond to the probability of zero error, one error, two errors, three errors, etc. So the protocol goes as follow. Start with a given state and then we'll call it zero, 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 zero. And it's really good to start with this one because it's already symmetrized. Apply the symmetric group. In fact, you don't really have to do this because it's always symmetrized. Then apply the Clifford groups. And uh, the first Clifford groups, let the noise come in your system. Apply the dagger of the Clifford group you apply. Then symmetrize and then observe. And what you see when you go through the details of the protocol is the poly matrix that will come in, the X and the Ys, will flip some of these bits and then you'll get a sequence of zeros and ones. You can measure the numbers of one, and by repeating uh, the experiment many, many, many times, you can extract the probability of zero errors when nothing happens here, probability of one error when there's only one one which happens here, probability of two errors when there's two. In fact, it's slightly different than what I'm just saying because if you have z errors here, they don't flip the bit, so then there's a, a a translation between the probability of the numbers of ones that comes here and the probability of x, y, or so those easy gates that comes in. But the upshot of all of this is that you can go and measure the probability of zero, one, two, three errors coming out of this. Now then, uh, if you implement the full symmetric group and Clifford group, it still becomes ex exponential. But fortunately, again, my friend, the computer scientist, say you don't need to do all of them. You just can sample them. So make sample the Clifford groups, implement these, and then you can go and um, <coughs> measure this probability. And you can do this with a number of gates, which doesn't go up exponentially. And then you can estimate these values of errors rather uh, efficiently. So this is work which was done roughly at the time of the last QEC uh, conference. And what I want to mention right now is to how to adapt this to certify Clifford gates. So instead of what we're certifying is one particular Clifford gate is the unit operation. Can we do this for other gates? And the answer is yes, we can do this. So this is the protocol I've just mentioned to you. It's not that hard to realize that if you want to certify a gate U, then you can add U and U dagger in here. And if U is a Clifford gate, we know that uh, we can implement it efficiently in a quantum computer. And we also know that the impact of this Clifford gate 
on another Clapper gate, but on a third Clapper gate, we're measuring in the combinational basis, and we know from the Neil uh, Gottesman theorem is that uh, evolving with Clifford gate is just a change of basis, which is going to change the zeros and ones that observed here will be related, and it is uh, classically efficient to compute the relationship between what we had measured before and the impact of one single uh, Clifford gate in here. So if we kind of realize that this is only a measurement in a slightly different computational basis that can be reached efficiently, then we can think about measuring it in that way. And what is left is the gate that we implement physically, the noise that comes in, and then the Clifford gate that we started with. And with this, we can certify gates in an efficient way and see how good we are at doing this. So here's an example of this for a small quantum processor. It's our solid state system with three quantum bits, the three carbons which are in the middle here. And then we wanted to certify how good we are at doing one and in fact three cu qubit gates in here. And the three qubit, there's two, three qubit gates we've done, the nothing operation, and then the uh, implementation of the quantum error cracking decoding uh, operation. Uh, we first did the benchmarking for the one qubit gate and get values which are of the order of 10 to the minus three. And then we uh, do this. Uh, when we do nothing, we get about 98%. So that particular Clifford gate of doing nothing, which turns out to be hard in MR doing nothing because the Hamiltonian is always there. We get errors about 2%, errors about 3% of when we do this. Uh, we also did something related to uh, what we call pulse fixing. I mentioned to you that we send little antennas down the uh, um, d down the bore of the, the, the magnet and kind of be sure that the pulse that we do is exactly what, or very similar to what we had thought. Here is an example of a pulse, and you see a small, disc the, the green is the ideal, the red is what's come out of uh, um, the amplifier. And you can see a small difference in there, and that small difference was enough to change the, the person by 10%. So in there, we were able to kind of gauge the different process and see how good we are at gauging the systems. So um, that gives you ideas of how we characterize noise for both one qubit and two qubit gates. What I want to do for the next kind of uh, about half an hour is to go through some of the error correcting procedures that have been implemented and see how are we in that direction. So we have an idea of how to characterize noise. We have an idea how good we are doing this. Now let's try to implement the, the ideas explicitly of error correction. So many of you might have seen this. This is not a new result. It's something that we've done um, when I was many years ago with David Corey, Manik Neal, and others. And it was with one molecule, trichloroethylene, where we implemented the, the error correction procedure. So we encode, we prepare a pseudo pure state, we encode, we leave some noise. The noise is of two types. Either we implement noise by hand and do bit uh, sign flips, or we leave the natural noise getting in the system, which will lead to T2, and then we do the error correction. We do the decoding and then the error correction. If we just do the decoding, we get a slope which looks like this. We do the error correction, we get something which is slightly better. And the demonstration that we had enough control for the process of error correction comes in and looking at these curves. And then we can see it starts at time equals zero. We don't get fidelity of one because implementing these gates don't come for free. There are errors, there are um, imperfection that comes in. So 20% of the fidelity just by implementing the encoding, decoding, and error correction. And then, but the demonstration or the claim that we had of the uh, error correction uh, demonstration here was that the first term, probability of one bit error was decreased by a factor of about a 10 by having a certain amount of control. Again, not perfect because our <coughs> errors are not perfect. So here's the same thing that was done a year ago. Same molecule. Uh, pretty much the same couplings and T1s and T2s and slightly different spectrometer. So I didn't go back to Los Alamos doing this. Um, we did this with a 700 spectrometer instead of 500 uh, at uh, Waterloo and put all this together. You can see that the uh, fidelity is much higher in there. So that was the old result, the new one, a little bit of scatter still, 
But if you turn this into equations, what you can see, the 1998 result is there, and the 2011 result is here. So you, you see that the, the, at zero time, the encoding, decoding, error correction procedure was much more precise. So 20% higher fidelity, or if you look at the error rate, uh, one minus the fidelity, about 1% uh, instead of about 20%. So about an order of magnitude increase in that set of gates. And the second thing is the first term here is about 10 times smaller than, uh, or five times smaller than what we had in the previous years. So here's an example of increased uh, control that we have in our system. Now this doesn't mean that we are doing full quantum error correction yet. We just, it just means we have the control of doing it. In an MR, we have to prepare the pseudo pure state. They take signal away. And this is one thing that we have to get over with if we want, really want to demonstrate full quantum error correction. I'd ask, what is the difference of control? What is the different scheme that we have? Well, we use what is called these gray pulse. So instead of doing very sharp, kind of 90 degree pulse, we say, here's the unitary transformation that we want, to, the desire that we want. Then we go and calculate one by uh, modulating the radio frequency field so that we get as near as possible at this one. So suddenly we can have continuous pulse instead of these blocks that we had before. And what I mentioned before, being using the feedback inside the, the spectrometer to be sure that the pulse that we do are really the one that we've desired. So demonstration of progress in there. Um, here's another demonstration of quantum error correction. Uh, superconducting qubits, and Matthew Reed is here, and I think he's going to give a talk straight after me, so I'm not going to mention uh, very much in there. Um, so again, demonstration here of error correction that this curve is flatter than what we would have when you don't correct for errors. Um, you can compare different fidelity. Oh, there's a plus minus uh, missing there. So the fidelity at zero time is about what an MR was 10 years ago. Not totally surprising, much harder in superconducting qubit, but if you look at the slope of the progress, they might well take over other technologies in not too long, especially in the number of quantum bits to be manipulated. Uh, if you map the, here for some reason, I don't fully understand, they didn't um, uh, map this with a, a first order term, so if they do, they have 0 0.03, which is the leftover one qubit errors, which would be correspond, uh, um, compared to this if you don't do error correction, and then again, an improvement in a factor of about 20. So demonstration that really they are getting to the control. Drawback of this experiment, um, not that different from NMR, they are not able to reset their cube and do many rounds of error correction yet. So what they did is implement the Toffoli gate, and then we, after one round, if they want to do it again, they need two more qubits prepared in the zero state and going and do this. So. If they want to do many rounds of error correction, the measurement needs to be improved. Um, here's another experiment, again in NMR with malonic acid. Here is doing two rounds of error correction. So we do one round of error correction, we do another round, and look at what is the result. Um, as I mentioned, we cannot reset the qubits here, so the way that we did this is doing very similar to what the optics people do. So post-selection of the results, post-selected in what the state of the, the qubits of the ancilla are over there. Put all of this together, here's what we get. No error correction is the curve in blue. The curve in red is if we do one shot of error correction, and if we do two shots of error correction, we have a fixed amount of time, and then we try to pack the two shots of error correction or one shot. So definitely if we do one shot of error correction, higher fidelity to start with, but suddenly the two qubit errors are starting to catch up, and then suddenly the probability goes down. If we do two shot error correction, then probability, initial probability is lower, but we can kind of stay faster, uh, stay longer with uh, a, a decent probability. So again, this is not a demonstration of two round of error correction, a full two round of error correction, because we have not reset the qubits, but it is a demonstration we have the control of being able to do this. Um, I have slides related to uh, uh, Reiner Blatt's experiment on uh, ion trap. He's going to talk about it at the end of the week, so I'm going to be very, uh, very fast on there. The idea is to do many rounds of error correction, and they had very neat devices where suddenly they can reset these qubits. 
and make the qubits kind of come back to zero and then start the process again. You look at the probability of getting back to the right state um, and there, kind of going down 90%, 80%, 70%. So it tells you the totals of doing this error correction. But also, if you don't do the error correction, then you would have errors which would be orthogonal to each other. Um, here's a curve. Um, if the errors are uh, correlated, they get the green curve. Uncorrelated errors is in the red. And so, again, we need demonstration that suddenly we can do error correction, and then we can do, in some devices, repeat uh, error correction in many times. Um, I read this paper. It was not clear to me if the noise in here was the natural noise in the trap or it, if it was errors which were induce in there. So we can see uh, quite often in some demonstration of error correction, people do this for noise that the engineers, it is a good demonstration of control, but it is not exactly where we want to go in the final step. So it is a step towards error correction. And Reiner can correct me either now or in, uh, in, uh, on Thursday when he gives this talk, uh, exactly this. Um, a few more. Um, uh, experiments with optics this time of erasure codes. Um, here's an erasure code which correct for one loss of one qubit somewhere and demonstration by the group of Pan in China and show that they can implement these particular codes. Found this quite interesting that by using only some pieces of down, down conversion, they are able to reach these codes and be able to do air correction. So as you know, with, with photons, very hard to do two qubit code, uh, two qubit uh, gates but they are able to find some ways and be able to, to do this. They go with these initial state and show that they are able to kind of get back with decent fidelity, about 75% uh, get back to the initial state. The drawback of this is that when the erasure comes in, it is an erasure by hand. So they say, okay, we're gonna go and put in front of one of these detectors, uh, you put your hand and you go and look at the results. So a demonstration, again, that you have the control, but it is not one that you could use that you can say you can go further, let's say, on an optic fiber to kind of reach a longer distance. At least not yet, we don't have the possibility of doing this. Similar experiments done in uh, Denmark by Klassen and al, not using the, f uh, the, uh, the spin degree of freedom or the polarization of the photons, but continuous variable. And again, the same thing. Here they do this and they kind of put a little, uh, they block one of the beam there and they show they can recover the information. Their gauge of how good it is is they do this with no entanglement in their uh, initial state and then get a red bar and then the blue bar is when they have entanglement, 50% fidelity and they claim that this is sufficient. Um, I'm slowly getting to the end of my presentation and I want to show one more example of a, a neutron uh, of error correction, in this case will be uh, of decorrence free space, where it does make a difference and where doing error correction here is very useful. So in that case, it's not a full quantum computer. It's just a small device, a neutron interferometer, and where suddenly by thinking about it from the quantum information point of view, you gain by doing a, a certain process. So the, the basic idea is you can use neutrons to, uh, in an interferometer to image certain device. Neutron comes in here, and then you can think about an empty uh, uh, direction from here. The neutron gets split in two, and hit this, um, this blade here, which looks like a, um, a beam splitter, makes the beam reconverge here, and then depending on the length of the path here, then the neutrons uh, appear either in the top or in the bottom line in there. We can use this to interfere, uh, uh, to image certain objects, either biological system, fuel cells, or devices where we put one of this little device on one part of the beam, and then we can kind of use this as a typical interferometer. Um, the problem with these neutron interferometer, and if you look at these devices, it's a few centimeters long, so about the size, the length of this uh, laser pointer, a bit wider. It's made of uh, one block of silicones, which has been hatched. And the reason which it has been hatched very precisely is the wavelength of these neutrons is about one angstrom. So the great thing about this is that you can image things on the size of angstrom. 
neutrons can go through matter and kind of, you know, uh, affecting it, can learn about uh, the magnetic properties or kind of uh, uh, atomic properties of the systems. You could look at cracks on the size of angstroms. But you know that if you're on the size of angstrom and then have an interferometer which is the size of this, very tiny, small um, vibration are going to uh, perturb the system. So if this interferometer moves by more than one angstrom, then the interference pattern here was going to be distorted. So the way that people do this at NIST, the neutron interferometry, is that they take these small devices and they put it on an optical bench. And then the optical bench is supported with the usual kind of isolation, which is now on a block about 40 tons of concrete, which is also supported with kind of different suspension to reduce uh, all vib vibration as possible. The room is isolated with first uh, uh, acoustic insulation and then thermal insulation with this. So if you look at the small devices, which is about that big, it's in a room which is probably a one sixth of the room in here, and then nothing can move in there, nothing can enter, and then you can go and image your, uh, your device that you want to go and look at. So what does this have to be with the current free subspace? So if you think of this as an interferometer, you can think about the state going through there as superposition of zero, nothing coming in here in one, and then as soon as you go to the first uh, beam splitter, you get a superposition of zero, one, and one, zero, and then you go through this, it interferes, and then at the end you have a superposition of alpha zero plus beta one, which comes out over there. And if you look at the dominant noise, it turns out that the dominant noise is rotation of the devices that way, which corresponds in this encoded qubit as e to the theta z. So also, if I write the pro project, uh, the, 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 the um, the problem in that way, how you would go and do, uh, make the system more robust. So you just build a decorrence free subspace, which would be a superposition of many of these states. So if you look at the first uh, beam I mentioned, with, this was one zero, zero one, and one, uh, zero one, and one zero, and then you go, to, oh sorry, one one, so the state zero and the state one. If you go and add more, uh, if you go and add more blade, then you can th think about the system going in there, making superposition of zero and one of the encoded one here. When you get to the second blade, then you have two possibilities: you go to the, go to the top or go to the bottom. Same here, go to the top or go to the bottom. The state at the top can be thought as the state one one, the state the state zero one, the state one zero, and the state at the bottom zero zero. And you look at this rotation, it will affect the state one one, the state one zero zero, but the zero one and one zero get compensated the same way. Get compensated the same way because this one goes down, this one goes up, which was different than the past in there. So if you have a rotation of the z-axis in there, then suddenly these two uh, distance get compensated with each other when it rotates. Then you can go to another blade, make it interfere, and going through. So you can go and do this, uh, this, uh, using this interferometer with more blades, which most of the neutron interferometer would think, if you add more blades, things will be more fragile. But if you restrict to certain specific uh, path, then it can become more robust. And this is really kind of the path that you can see here. If you take the path in red, instead of the one which is in the blue over there, then they become, makes the whole interferometer more robust. You take this interferometer, the three blade one, and you look at what is the impact of when there's no rotate, no vibration, you make this happen. And then the, you can add the vibration in there by making this table shake in the Z direction. And then you get something where you lose most of the contrast. You do the same thing with the five blade interferometer. And then you can look at what happens when you do not have rotation and when you have rotations and you can see that you can recover most of the contrast in both places. So here's an example of error correction, or DFS, where suddenly it makes a big difference. How big the difference is, is that you can certainly take the interferometer that you put in that table, and you can put it outside this big room. So suddenly you can make this happen because the signal to noise ratio in here is increased by about 600%. So create an improvement in the place where you can remake a difference with quantum error correction. I'm nearly running out of time, and then the last thing I'm going to mention is 
magic state distillation. So we've heard yesterday about if we have uh, Clifford gates, we can go into quantum computation in a fault-tolerant way using transversal gate. But in order of becoming universal, we need to add a uh, magic state. Problem with magic state is what happens if they are not perfect, how do you make them better? So that was the work of uh, Kedef and Bravi uh, some years ago, showing that if you don't start with a perfect magic state, one with p equal to one in here, how can you find a way to distill them? And it turns out they can distill them through the five, uh, the decoding of the five qubit error correcting code. So the basic idea is take five copies of imperfect um, magic states, making, making them go through the decoding of the five bit codes, go and measure the state in zero for the last four qubits, and then you'll get rho prime prime at the end. And what they showed is that if uh, phi prime is greater than 0 0.65, or approximately greater than this, then you'll get a p prime prime at the end, which is greater than this. So by doing this distillation, you'll go up here on the line, and then you can start again and start again. And as you do this, then you can make yourself climb up that way. So the first time I read this uh, algorithm, I said, oh, this is very neat. So this is the line which is between the center of the block sphere to the point which is equidistant of x, y, z on the block sphere. So if you're far uh, near enough the magic state, then you can make many copies of this magic state and make, a, make it converge towards a magic state. Is this robust? When is, if you're a little bit outside this line, so you're not exactly on, a, on that line, will you be able to converge on that place? And it turns out that the answer is yes, as kind of you're near enough this part. So even if you're not exactly on that line, a little bit on the side, you can see that it is converging to this point. So once you have this, you can say, okay, you can go and do some experiments, and here's a result of this experiment. This is not in the solid state that I've mentioned in the past, or the ESR, it's in the, back in the solid, in the liquid state, the place where we have more than three or four qubits. We needed five from here. Um, so the chronic acid that we've used in the past. And then you can see the input state that we started with, the output state that we got. And you can see some distillation here, go to 96 instead of 95, 94 instead of 88. And so you can see the points here. The red line corresponds to a simulation of, um, of the distillation process when we, with T2 and uh, the the blue line is with T2 star, just to give us an idea of what is the effect on the coherence during, during that process. So here's an, if above that line here, we have successfully distilled, when we are uh, below, then we make the states worse than what we started with. So we were able to show and demonstrate a little bit of this magic state distillation here in that case. Okay, I've run out of time, so in conclusion. So I hope I've convinced you that there's been progress of on experimental quantum error correction in the last few years. In particular, by having a better knowledge of the noise, methods of uh, finding out what is the noise in our quantum systems. I have my friend, the theorist, who says, if you get the threshold, then you're home free. But what is this value of air pair gate? Well, how do I get this number once in the lab and I have a bunch of gates which are imperfect? How do I reach this number? And this attempt of understanding how to get there um, has been part of my comments today. Uh, we've definitely improved the amount of control in many devices. Uh, superconducting qubits, ion trap, or ESR, in the last five years, probably an order of magnitude more control than what we had before. There's still some room to go. So for s the single qubit gates, I believe we understand pretty much how to do this. Uh, for many qubit gates, then we need to improve again, but it's in the path for implementing quantum error correction. Ability to extract entropy in the experiments of Reiner Blatt, definite uh, way of doing this. I've not mentioned about algorithmic cooling, something that I mentioned four years ago. It's a place for NMR and maybe superconducting qubits to go into, and the ability to do this. Um, so we definitely have had some progress, but it's only the beginning of experimental quantum error correction and its faltering implementation. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ramon, for the beautiful talk. It's exciting to see all the progress that's been made in the last four years. We have time for some questions.
So you mentioned that the error per gate is higher than can be explained only by the phasing, by say T1 processes, the coherence. That means that you perform errors in the control pulses, although you try hard to prevent them. So my question is, people that uh, discuss the environment or the noise of the, of the environment without control use, for example, correlation time to see what is the full statistical description of the noise. Can you do or did you do a similar analysis to the noise in the control? For example, if I give two pulses close to each other, there are probably correlated errors, and if the time is large, it's uncorrelated. Can, can it come out from your analysis? Yeah. So when we um, first look at the, 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 these curves to find what is the error per gate, to get to the depolarizing model, we have to assume that the error is, independ is independent from gate to gate and time independent. And if you add time dependence, you'll see that it will not be a straight exponential curve, but you'll see it kind of going away a little bit from this. And we've seen this in some example in NMR with effects of gradients, or we can also see it when we um, make more and more gates, the amplifiers heat up, and then suddenly kind of uh, gets a little bit kind of um, uh, out of whack, and so you can see these things. So you can make, if the error, the time dependence is small, you can do perturbation theory and look at what is the effect of this and go and look at exactly what you, you're thinking. There's a very nice paper by Joseph Emerson uh, from Waterloo who kind of go this in all details how to make this happen. Questions? Um, yeah, I have a question about uh, Clifford uh, groups and in particular how efficient it is to sample over that you have mentioned that uh, uh, in passing I understand that for single qubit Clifford and then you use the Chernoff bound it's all okay, but maybe I'm missing, if you have many qubits in principle, does it remain uh, efficient? So in that case... Or is it known how to do it efficiently? So it's really a computer scientist uh, comment, and Richard Lee would be the best person to answer this. Um, in the protocols that we have here, we just have to be doing the one qubit gates when we... Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and I'm familiar with yep. this protocol, but... So we can do this. If you want to sample the two and three, yeah. I don't know what is the answer to that. Okay. But I know who has the answer for that. Okay, and, and that's Richard right. is the person. Right. Anyone else? Well, I have a question. Have you, Ramon, ever personally been twirled? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I expected a faster answer. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So maybe not by a poly, maybe not by I a poly. I thought you would say yes, and then I would say that that must have been very disorienting. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, well, maybe the next speaker should come forward. Let's thank Ray again.